Welcome to Keep It, Cricket Media show about pop culture and politics and what happens when they smack into each other at an alarming speed. I'm your host, Ira Madison III, a television writer and Fallout Boy fan. I'm Louis Fertel, I'm a TV writer and Jane Fonda historian. And I'm Aida Osman, I'm a TV writer and alleged comedian. Let's get into it. We got a new guest host this week again. We have Doreen St. Felix here. Hi, Ira. <laughs> You've been on Keep It before. They know I who have. you are. On Sunday, we checked out of the White Lotus for the last time, at least until season two. So just so y'all know, that means we're about to talk about White Lotus, the finale. So if you have not watched it yet, stay out of my DMs about spoilers. So from the second a corpse was rolled onto the plane in the premiere, takes started rolling on Twitter People started saying who was dead. People were talking about whether or not this is a satire, whether or not it's a self-aware takedown of colonialism, or is it actually just a product of colonialism itself? So, White Lotus, what are y'all feeling about it? Can I just say that I hate that binary thinking? I don't like binaries. Put me mm. down as not liking binaries. Okay. Does it have <laughs> to be? The hottest take. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Which is to say, I watched that show on in one fell swoop because I had the screeners because I'm really important because I'm a TV critic. Mm. And mm. the show is actually not telling you to watch it as a satire, right? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like there are certain satirical notes when you see the first few episodes, you meet some characters who feel like caricatures. And then Mike White, as he always does, this affection kind of arises, right? And you start to see, for instance, Tanya McQuad, Jennifer Coolidge's character as someone with an inner life and so on and so forth. And so I just get a little frustrated when, I mean, maybe it's not frustration. I'm certainly interested in the idea of the show's meta relationship to colonialism, but I think it's kind of like a show at the end of the day and it's not supposed Mm -hmm. to be performing this um, takedown action or mechanism or appraising of, you know, like the white liberal imagination i think it's just like a little bit smarter than people are maybe diluting it to be online but that's just my thought it's also Mm. to me like i guess the suspense of the show is the sense that all the characters will probably interact in one way or another and so i found myself kind of guessing like oh how will jennifer coolidge and this kid interact or what you know like you're kind of guessing like how these uh, storylines will intertwine and i feel like that's more where my head is at than actually a meta narrative just because these people are so unpredictably uh in some cases self-absorbed but also like occasionally showing heart or whatever that i'm predicting where the explosions will happen more than i'm guessing you know that the, having really anything else smarter to say about it so it's more like a reality show you know i'm i'm more thinking like how will these people like blow up at each other well i mean the connection to a reality show is one of the important pieces of the puzzle, mostly because Mike White loves Survivor and has been on it. Uh, And And he brings it up like it's, you know, Dostoevsky every time he does like uh, (laughs) an interview. He's like... (laughs) And he famously came in second on the David versus Goliath season um, to Nick. And I found the series almost sort of like he was just writing Survivor. You know, we know he mm-hmm. wrote it in a few weeks. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, it was him picking, like, a tropical location, and he just loves characters. The one thing I love about Mike White's shows is that, like, he likes wacky, sort of, like you said, almost satirical characters that sort of reveal themselves, like, the heart behind them, even the awful characters towards the end. And I sort of feel like Armand was a representation for himself and him sort of, like, battling with um jake jake lacy's character um shane the entire time was sort of him replicating his survivor time and like shane winning at the end was sort of like nick beating him um but that said i really liked this gay character in it i thought that he was really interesting and something we sort of haven't seen sort of like murray bartlett getting to play a gay breaking bad But I will say that I'm not worried about the whole, like, is it satirizing or, like, taking down white people? Because too many people expect shows with white casts to do that now, as if every white creator needs to be invested in creating a show that is going to 
skewer whiteness in general. I mean, just watch Succession if you want to see that. <laughs> um, but as a show, I found it a little bit wanting. I enjoyed the show, but if you even watch it as just a show, I feel like every beat in every episode and every story was 80% predictable. That's really interesting. I have been thinking of The White Lotus as a very ornate experiment in Mike White's oeuvre because he's a really fascinating creator. Like School of Rock, Dawson's mm-hmm. Creek. He has made some of the most mainstream of mainstream television and film and people like at the same time don't really know who he is people who Mm -hmm. like aren't pop culture obsessives and then he's made shows like enlightened which i mean bring it back honestly hbo (laughs) it's the renaissance it's the perfect time that's a show where like part of the reason why it was canceled was that people didn't really watch it and so i think Mm -hmm. the white lotus is ending up being caught in ensnared even in this strange um attention economy where like mike white his shows or his films like that are much more subtle or campier or feel like more art house are now getting an attention that they're they weren't maybe necessarily like created for this is Mm -hmm. so clearly an idea that he had hbo approached him he wrote it he directed all the episodes they shot it in one location four seasons um in hawaii and it has both the fortune and the misfortune of coming out during a time where people, their parasocial relationships to television is just off the charts because that's kind of all they've been doing for a year and a half. Um, so like, I don't know, I've been watching people sort of get really angry at these characters. Paula is an example of someone mm. that people Natasha are very... Rothwell. No, not no, Paula, Paula is Brittany Paul- O'Grady. Oh, yes, yes. Sydney Sweeney's friend. Oh. Not all black women okay. look the same. <laughs> First of all, you know, I'm, you know, I watch so much TV that I'm like a black auntie when I watch it. I just be like, oh, you know, um, Paula was over there talking to Connie Britton. Uh, you know, I, I remember characters by their actor's name by or their the first name. Names. Well, by the way, this show is like a prime example of, oh, wait, that's the character's name. Like when you said that Jennifer Coolidge's character is named Tanya, I'm like, well, are you sure? <laughs> that's It is Tanya. Wow. I yeah. mean, going back to Big Big Little Lies, I, mean, I feel like people know half the cast name. Right. And Renata. Just, Renata yeah. and Reese Witherspoon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love that slippage, you know, like Mike White really understands white women. He just Mm. like picks women that people already have so much like spiritual investment in. And when you're watching Tanya, you're like, but that's also Jennifer, you know, is Jennifer Mm -hmm. like getting out something like a revenge fantasy for the way that she's been sequestered by Hollywood in -hmm. the past 30 years? Like, I'm a read so into it, you know, (laughs) and he knows that he has me. I want to know if Molly Shannon has some like residual rage, which I believe is channeled pretty well through this character. I wouldn't say it's perfect casting. There are, per- I think, actresses who do better the thing of like, oh, I'm evil. I'm like leaning in and like getting in your face about how bad a person I am. But Molly Shannon just has a, a, a very inherent quaintness that makes the character a little bit more interesting, even though I don't know if I love the casting. But we can, anyway. I adore Molly Shannon, but I agree. I did not like her in that role. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. it sort it sort of didn't jive with who I felt his mother was supposed to be, uh, right? Based uh-huh. on how he was acting. But uh, what were you saying about Paula? Well, so Paula is someone who she's kind of, red herring is maybe like too strong of a term to use, but people became really attached to her when they were watching the first few episodes because mm-hmm. she felt like a surrogate for the viewer. One mm-hmm. because she was non-white. Two, because she seemed to be not as wealthy as the Mossbacker family, who's mm-hmm. kind of like a cross between like Goop and the Yahoo lady CEO, <laughs> played by <laughs> Connie Britton. Everyone thought she was Sarah Sandberg, and I saw like theories Steve Zahn was going to die. And, like oh, that's Sheryl Sandberg's horrible. husband <laughs> died oh, on my vacation. God. <laughs> that oh, was our, that was my... our friend Chris Schleicher. <laughs> That is out of pocket, even for Facebook, the most evil entity on earth. (laughs) But yeah, so Paula, you know, she was the thing that made watching the show bearable. And then she does something at the end of the series that is completely unbearable. Some people might argue the most immoral act in the show. And Mm. people got mad at her and people are still really mad at her. And they're just like, as a woman of color, like, how could you send this like 
native Hawaiian to jail or whatever. Uh. And it's like, the show <laughs> is such a great examination of the differences or the space between what it is that people do and how they act. Yes. Mm. What it is that they think and what their, you know, records show. We all talk one way. We all are really righteous, but we all do some shit that doesn't like at all align with, you know, the um, politics that we proclaim to. I love that to. because, you know, we've talked about this before, you know, like, especially on the internet, people love to get into specific like binaries of like, take for instance, even like the Z way question, you know, of like, um, would you call the police on like a black person? Like, it's funny in theory, right? And everyone on the internet is like, oh, you know, like, yeah, you can't call the police on the black people like doing this, etc. But it's like, okay, if a black man is breaking in your home with a gun about to kill you or a knife, you know, like if you're pressed in this situation, what are you going to do? And I think a lot of people on the internet try to create like X-Men danger room games for life of what they know that they would do when you know that if any of the like fake scenarios people come up with on the internet are not how they're actually going to act in real life. We saw that with COVID, the way that people mm. talk about rules and what they should be doing and how other people should be doing. And then you've seen a year or like you see a friend at a party, like when it's quarantine or you're doing this, it's like everyone acts differently when this stuff happens. So I think it's very silly to have Paula sitting there thinking, well, you know, like I can't get a native Islander arrested <laughs> by getting him involved in a crime. You know, she's not sitting there and thinking how people are going to react online um, or morally to what she's trying to accomplish. I do want to thank uh, both her and Sydney Sweeney, though, f <laughs> specifically for their facial reactions throughout the entire show. I mean, I'm not saying I'm somebody when I watch a TV show, I need to see my reactions soundboarded exactly or whatever. But man, just the gift worthiness of looking at Connie Britton with like, an eyelid moving back or, <laughs> or, or, or like the grimace dropping. It's just like really subtle, but like harsh um, acting that I think are maybe the most fun acting moments in the whole show, actually, even though people get lots of great character revealing monologues, et cetera. I would agree. And I think I also want to um, Fred had, I want to talk about Fred Hetchinger, I think is how you pronounce his surname. He plays Quinn and Quinn ends up being in the finale, sort of the symbol I think he's like a melancholic symbol of escape, right? Mm -hmm. Because he decides to stay in the island. He literally is the dead weight that helps <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the native islanders like become stronger swimmers. Like he's just uh, not swimmers. Um, are they on a yeah. canoe? Crewmen or rowmen or whatever. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, what would the Harvard team be doing? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> the Winklevossary or but whatever. But the, pre, yes. the pre-colonized version of Yes, that. yeah. Um, Moana. I think that the three of them, him, Sydney, and Brittany, are kind of like this incredible triptych of like what Gen Z actually is. Like Gossip Girl is like totally didactic, doesn't have the characters like actually speaking like people. Girl. And through these, in some ways, we're not we're not talking about gossip. Girl. I'm just using it to make my point. We're not going there. But through these almost like non-verbal or like half-verbal performances, we just get so much fuller of a portrait of mm -hmm. this generation, especially because they're interacting with people of a different generation, like Connie. Mm -hmm. Also, that reminds me once of years ago, I interviewed um, Ira, who directed Carol. Sorry, his name is not coming to me Todd right Haynes. now. Todd, Todd Haynes. Haynes. Jesus, Todd Haynes. Why and did I you said, ask me who directed I, I, Carol Lewis? I, I, I'm, just, I'm likelier to burden <laughs> Ira with a conversation about Todd Haynes. I didn't mean to take that off of you, Doreen. We are constantly talking about Todd Haynes, to okay. be fair. I asked the director, I was like, I find this the rare movie to be transfixing, as in I can't stop watching it. I was like, do you have any idea what the X factor is of this movie that makes it this way? He goes, how about watching people think is so much fun? And I think that's a key part of this show that is extra compelling is even when it's not, you know, people complain it doesn't have enough plot or there's not enough going on. But honestly, it's always giving you something to look at, whether it's somebody giving, you know, a sarcastic response or just thinking for an extra second, which is uh, such a pleasure to see. Uh, and it's such a good Lewis, chapter. Lewis, we know you love watching white women think. That's the entire reason you like sharp objects. People sitting in cars thinking 
of that bored ass show. And especially if there's like the the vague idea of old tears on their face, not even new tears. They've been crying for a while. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, or Kate Blanchett, the world's slowest smiler, which is my favorite thing about her. Anyway, but that's I think we specifically got a lot of that in this show, which is a great entry in what I will call incompetence vaudeville, like Veep and Succession. Should we discuss though? As much as we all seem to be fans of the show, should we discuss some of the criticisms regarding kind of like the paradox of making a show about people who are, you know, terminally tied to their wealth and setting it on the island of Hawaii? And filming it there. (laughs) During the pandemic, (laughs) so many Native Hawaiians had been telling tourists to not come because they were like literally bringing infection um, to their home. And I think that there are... I don't know. There were some like music drops in the show that are outside of Cristobal's like amazing, creepy, eerie score that felt a little like, oh, are you just playing this like kind of hokey song that everyone associates with Hawaii mm. to kind of like, it felt like there were, there were just a few moments where I was like, mm, Mike White's not like completely confident or not completely owning Mm -hmm. or self-indicting himself as a creator. And like Kai also is a character that I just thought was done no justice. He has no, I don't even mind that he disappears. Mm -hmm. I think that's like, it's in keeping with the tenor of the story, but his backstory that his family like owned the land Mm -hmm. that the hotel was on, it was just like really trite, really simple. And I think that there's, you have to figure out okay, these people can't be at the center of the story, right? I just haven't created the show for that to happen. But how can I give them enough depth that even in their smallness, they are like equally contending with the largest of someone like Tanya or the other characters? And I felt that that wasn't done well. I think it sort of goes to sort of just like, you know, Mike White's telling of the story um, and just sort of how... um, Hawaii and sort of like these cultures have been entrenched um, in American popular culture because like even if he was wanting to like do a good thing here I did agree about the music it constantly felt like I was watching like um, Hawaii Five-0 like the original (laughs) you know when there'd be like something mysterious happening on the island and you hear this sort of music even like even the theme song is uh, which is a banger Um, but you know, like so much of the music feels, you know, sort of like, you know, like when you're watching like Betty Davis in the letter and you start hearing Oriental music, you know, when like the, like the Asian woman, um, shows up to curse her, it felt very much that. And yeah, not even just Kai disappearing, the girl disappearing who gave birth, you know, in the first episode too. I want to say that I feel like you can't have it both ways if you're Mike White. Like, the one, in one way, the show doesn't have to be commenting specifically on white people and trying to tear down, like, this colonialist system. But then if you also want to say that the point of the story is that these white people are taking over and then so that's why the other characters drop out, then it just doesn't work for me. And that's when I sort of meant that it felt sort of like unfulfilling to me in the end because I know that he likes genre. I've talked about this on the show before. Like he had that 2000 um, Fox show that got canceled, Pasadena with um, Dana Delaney that was like a primetime soap. You know, like we know that he likes that kind of stuff. And I felt like as a show with like a mystery in the beginning and that was soapy and having characters interact it sort of just went to an ending that you sort of expected, especially like Natasha, Natasha Rothwell and Jennifer Coolidge. I think everybody saw where that story Definitely. was going to be going. Mm-hmm. At the end, mm-hmm. we saw she was going to be hurt when she changed her mind about doing the spa. So I was just thinking, like, why not as a writer, even if you're getting us to that conclusion and that's what you want to say, why not surprise us a bit more in that story? Yeah, well, I will say, I think a lot of the strengths of the show hap- uh, are that what occurs, I don't know that I always expect it, but in retrospect, it feels inevitable, which is just a feeling I like, period. Like, I, the movie that comes to mind is if you've ever seen Two Days, One Night with Marion Cotillard, she's fighting to save her job, and what happens at the end of the movie, I wouldn't have written that way, and yet it feels true to life, and I feel like that 
is true about a lot of what happens in the show. That said, the least believable part of the show is Natasha Rothwell's character just signing on full to this like hokey person, you know, who is never once a credible just as like a uh, a human being that you would believe anything from, you know, she's like wandering into every shot. She's like drowsy constantly. Um, though, by the way, Natasha Rothwell's performance then became sort of um, the surprising focal point of the finale for me. I really was most invested in her character at the end, I think. Yeah. Well, I think that there was an interview that Mike White did with Vulture too, where he was just talking about this was how he was telling this story just because um, I think people were expecting him to give sort of a, enlightened sort of storyline where you know like that was Amy Jellico like fighting for like justice uh constantly and trying to like unravel pieces uh and I think he says that like a show like that would be too much like trying to play to the zeitgeist now you know um Mm -hmm. and I think maybe you know that the reception to that maybe it's just gotten into his head because I feel like enlightened as much as it almost seems in line with like sort of like internet social justice now like it it's that's not that show at all and i felt like enlightened was a show about people especially her trying to make herself a better human being um you know like i really connected with that part of that character uh and i thought it always went to a lot of surprising emotional places and ultimately i just feel like i wasn't surprised emotionally a lot during um the White Lotus is all. But it was fun. Ultimately, who was surprised that Murray was the one who died? Like, doesn't that feel so right? Like, it had to have been him. And paralleling that, who was surprised that Rachel stayed with Shane? Right. N- nobody. She yeah. made the decision that she had already made. Yeah. <laughs> she got married like a week before. And all, Why would she? <laughs> the show starts with her having a, a conversation with him that would turn most people away. So the fact that she would even stay through that seemed to indicate, all right, she can ha- she can um, bear a lot of him. Yeah. Um, actually, before we even wrap on that, I want to say that one of the most actual surprising moments of the series, um, which was a great character moment, I feel, was when she approached Connie Britton and was like, I wrote about you. <laughs> yes. And then was explaining it. And then Connie Britton was like, oh, no, you're a shitty writer. <laughs> that was a completely surprising moment, but also felt so in character for both of them. Um, and I wish I wish I had had more scenes like that in the finale. And also, that feels very um, keyed into how Mike White understands the internet, too. Just the conversation about the kinds of pieces Alexandra Daddario had been writing, you know. I mean, I feel like that's the kind of thing that might warrant one or two dismissive jokes on other shows. Whereas they kind of really got into the specific nature of the uh, fluff piece she had written. And I was uh, pleased to uh, realize the show was literate in that. Yeah, I mean, even shout out to making relatable Gen Z characters and not having an older character even use the term Gen Z Mm. or millennial and have dumb jokes like that. So... All right, White Lotus was um, not quite white excellence for me. Uh, what's right <laughs> below excellence, Doreen? Mm. Oh, because we coined this term, didn't I we? I know, we coined white excellence. What were we talking about? Ooh, I think I'm embarrassed to say, but I think it was Stranger Things. Oh, very good. Very good. Very good. Season very good. one. Stranger Things season one Listen. was white excellence. Trump was president. It was a different time. But I I will agree. It was white pastiche excellence. I would argue white lotus is white excellence. But if you want um, maybe a different term, you could say white proficiency. (laughs) Okay. That doesn't work. It did what needed to be done. (laughs) 